I have the, uh, the privilege of doing um, a good bit of coaching with pastors uh, across country. And uh, one of the questions uh, that I'll ask pastors when I'm um, meeting with them or talking with them by phone and they're describing their church situation or their personal situation and kind of get an idea of where they want to go, one of the questions I'll ask them is, what is, what is the one thing, if you, could, if you could change one thing, it would make everything else different? What would be the one thing that you could change that would really help you move the ball the furthest down, down the field? If you could change just one thing that you think, boy, if I could just change that one thing, it would open up a lot of other, what would that be? It's amazing to me how it helps pastors to not get lost in all of the things that need to be done and really get down to some of the critical things that if you can just do that, uh, everything else can change. Now, that's really important because I think we sometimes get paralyzed. Um, I heard years ago that if you've ever seen those old pictures of a lion tamer, you remember how they use a stool and the, you know, and the whip and that kind of thing, and, which never made sense to me. I thought, if I'm in a cage with a lion, I want a gun. You know, I don't want a stool, I want a gun. But they use a stool, and what I've heard is that they do that because when they point those legs at the lion, the lion doesn't have the ability to focus on all of them at once, and so it gets paralyzed because it's constantly going from leg to leg and, and it actually causes a paralysis. Well, that's what happens to us when we're trying to focus on so many things in our life. We, we see all of these things and then we end up doing nothing at all. Now, some years ago, I, I was with a pastor and we got talking about that one thing that he needed to do and he, he, he made the comment. He said, you know, Steve, he said, wouldn't it be great to do a sermon series on one thing? And I filed that away. And, um, and then when I was working on stuff heading into the summer, I, I remembered that. I went back and I read some of my notes and I thought, that's what I want to talk about. Several times in scripture, that little phrase, one thing is used. And when I was going through looking at those passages of scripture, I realized again how powerful they are. Uh, next week, I'm going to talk about that one thing that is holding most of us back from really embracing the future that God has for us. Uh, and in a couple of weeks on Father's Day, I'm going to talk about what's that one thing that's really keeping us from being the men and women of God that he wants, to be, wants us to be. Um, in in, in th three weeks, when I finish this series, I'm going to be talking about what's that one thing that really kind of gets us between from good, better, to what's really best for us. That's what I want to talk about. But today, I want to talk about the most important thing. Are you ready? If you want to take your sermon outline out, if you like to take notes or track along or doodle to keep yourself awake, whatever works for you, I want to, I want to look at a story from John chapter 9. And I didn't put all the scripture there. I got just have one verse, but I want, to, I want to give you the background for the story so you understand the context. In John chapter 9, Jesus and his disciples are, are walking along, and they, they come across a guy who was not only blind, he was born blind. And there was a, a, a theory in those days that if something catastrophic has happened to someone, it had to be because somebody sinned. And so the disciples asked Jesus the question, so who sinned? Was it this guy or was it his parents? And Jesus makes this remarkable statement. He says, you know what? Neither. This guy, his blindness, this is going to show the great wonderful work that God can do. And so Jesus does something that's that's really weird. He, uh, he, he spits down in the dirt, and he makes some mud pies out of it. And then he takes it, and he rubs it on the guy's eyes. Now, if, if you're blind, and somebody starts putting mud on your eyes, you're probably not thinking this is a good thing, you know? Um, you're probably thinking somebody's mocking you, somebody's picking on you, bullying you, whatever. But Jesus puts this mud on the guy's eyes, and then he says, I want you to go to wash it off in the pool of Siloam. And so the guy does, and here's what's, what's unbelievable. The guy goes, and he washes this stuff off, and as he washes the mud out of his eyes, he could see. Now, think about this. You're born blind, never been able to see, and then all of a sudden, you wash this stuff off, and the whole world comes to life. Well, you can only imagine how excited this guy was. You can imagine how, how he was just taken back. About it. And you can imagine what was going on for the people who knew him and see him jumping up and down and being all excited, and he's saying, I can see, and they're going, what? What do you mean you can see? You could never see. You were blind. 
You know, and everybody's just freaking out. Well, the, the people took him, and they wanted to go show the religious leader. So they took him to the Pharisees. These guys were the head kahunas, you know, of the, of the religious faith during that time. And as they got there, the, the, the religious leaders, they heard what happened. They got upset. They weren't excited at all. They were upset, one, because Jesus wasn't one of them, and secondly, because it was a Sabbath day, and making mud pies is work, and you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. And these guys were so legalistic, they couldn't, they couldn't rejoice with what was going on. So they come at this blind guy, and they just go, you know, who did this? And the blind guy says, yeah, it was Jesus. You know, and they go, well, he couldn't have done this. Well, he did. And they're going back and forth and back and forth, and, and they're getting madder and madder and madder. And they say, you know what? We, we know this Jesus, and he's, he's not a prophet. He's not he's, he's a sinner. And look at how the guy responds. This is on your outline. This is our verse today. Read it with me. And he replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know. I was blind, but now I see. Say that again. I was blind, but now I see. That's the one thing he knew. Here's my question to you. Do you know what Jesus has done for you? Do you know what Jesus has done for you? You see, I could talk about a lot of things in this series, but the most important thing that we're going to talk about is what we're going to talk about today, and that is this. Do you know what Jesus Christ has done for you? And if he hasn't, done for you, a life-changing thing, would you open your heart to allow that to happen? This man's life was forever changed by one touch of Jesus' hand. Just think what he could do for you. Amen? You bet. Now, I, I, I stepped into this story, and I read it through a few times, and I, I just was asking God, Lord, help me, help me think some thoughts about this story that are things I could share with my people that, that will maybe challenge them wherever they are in their journey of life or, or, or maybe even encourage and help them on their journey of faith. And, and here are the things I want to share with you that hopefully we'll take, you can take home and, and put to good use. You ready? Here we go. Here's the first thought I want to give you. This hit me when I was reading about how the Pharisees were encountering him. Our religious activities don't mean anything. Jesus is everything. I'm going to say that again. Our religious activities don't mean anything. Jesus is everything. Oh, I thought I'd get at least one amen. Let me, let me read that one more time. Our religious activities don't mean anything. Jesus is everything. Amen. You bet. If you missed that, you've missed it all. You've missed it all. One of my favorite stories of all time happened when I was here as a youth pastor. This is the church that I started out at back in the early 1800s. Um, I would, 1980s, I, 1981, I came here as a youth and associate pastor and, and was here for six years. And while I was here, my wife and I had a, a little duplex over here by OCCC. And, and um, one night I'm, I'm at the office and um, I'm working and I, I love what I do. And it's really easy for me to do it way too much. And one, one evening, I, one, one day I got working late into the day and time got away from me and I'm sitting there and this is before cell phones and before all that kind of stuff. And, and all of a sudden the, the church phone rings and I pick it up, and, you know, Chartel Church of God, and it's Wanda. And Wanda says, are you coming home like sometime tonight? And I'm like, oh, goodness, you know, got away from, I'm so sorry. And she goes, well, I got dinner ready, and, and we're waiting to eat, and we just, you know, you got to get, you, we need you here. And I said, okay, okay, I'll tie it up, and I'll get home quickly. You know, and, I'm, I'm, and I said, what's for dinner? And she says, chicken tetrazzini. And I said, oh, that sounds good. And I have no idea what it is, but, you know, you got to tell your wife it sounds good. You know what I'm saying? And it's kind of like, you know, kind of like when she says, you know, whatever, you got to say yes, it, it sounds good. So I'm, I'm zooming home. 
And uh, I get home, and Wanda's sitting at the table. She has the table all set. And, um, and, and you know, Ben was very small then. He was sitting in his high chair. And, and so we sit down, and we, we have a word of prayer. And then Wanda's dishing this casserole up. And it's kind of a, you know, you know what Tick and Chesterzini is? Anybody know? Yeah, it's like made out of spaghetti noodles and, you know, kind of got uh, all this stuff in it. And um, so, you know, I'm, I, and I'm one of those guys, I eat anything. Anybody like that? I, I eat, I've, I'm the Will Rogers of food. I've never met a food I don't like. You know, I just, I eat it all. And so I'm very easy to please, and Wanda's dishing it up, and it's hot, and I'm, I'm kind of woofing it down. And Wanda's a really picky eater, and she's eating, and she finally says, this doesn't taste right, does it? Now, that's a setup. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's, that's like your wife asking you, does this make me look fat? You know, it's just kind of like, you know, if you say yes, you're dead. You know, you can't, you can't say that. So I, she goes, you know, this doesn't taste right. And I said, well, it's, you know, it's pretty good. I said, it just doesn't have a real strong chicken taste. And my wife goes, oh, the chicken. <laughs> yeah. She had made this chicken tretrazzini without the chicken. She had got the chicken. She had cut up the chicken. She had put the chicken in the refrigerator. She just forgot to mix it in with the casserole. So what we had were nice, warm spaghetti noodles with cream of chicken soup and sour cream. You know, everything but the chicken. That is the picture of so many of our religious experiences. Look at me. Hear my heart with this. There are people who have grown up in the church. Man, I'm, I'm third generation church of God. I've been in church since I was a week old. But there are people who grow up. They go to church every week. They, 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 they go through all of this stuff, but they've never really encountered Jesus. And can I tell you something? If you've missed Jesus, you've missed it all. He's everything. You know, you, going to church doesn't make you a Christian no more than going in your garage makes you a car. It just it doesn't happen like that. And, and it's, it, we, we have all this religious activity. We do all these things. But I want you to hear me loud and clear today. I don't care how many times you go to church. I don't how much care how much Bible you've memorized. I don't care what kind of degree you've graduated from Bible college with. I, I don't care what kind of things you have done in the name of God. If you've missed Jesus, you've missed it all. You've just missed it all. And you don't have to take my word for it. Take his on your outline. John 14, 6. And Jesus told him, read it with me, church, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. The disciples got this. You know, when Peter and John were called before the religious people for preaching about Jesus and, and they, were, you know, they were beating them and saying, you can't, you can't teach this way. What, what are you doing? Look at what Peter says. He says, for Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures where it says, the stone that you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. Read this out loud, loud and clear. You ready? There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. Now, it's so interesting to me how often people read that stuff or hear that stuff and they'll say, well, you know, that's just being exclusive. No, it's not. It's being inclusive. God loved us so much, he didn't want there to be any doubt how we reconnect with him. For God so loved this world, he sent his one and only son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Look at me, hear my heart. If you're doing a lot of religious activities, I'm proud of you. But there's one thing that is the most important thing, and his name is Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let me give you a second thought I had about this story of the blind man. and Some of you can relate to this is that our, our encounters with Jesus are unique to each of us. Our encounters with Jesus are unique to each of us. Now, why this is so important is one of the things I realized that was going on with the Pharisees is they had a real hard time with this blind man because he wasn't encountering God like they had encountered God. 
And, and there's a, a tendency to, sometimes to kind of cookie cutter people and say, you know, you, you need to have encountered God the way I have encountered God. You need to have had the same experience with Jesus that I had with Jesus. And what you discover is this guy's experience was really unique. In fact, it was funny because I was thinking, I put this on your outline, I was thinking about the fact that this, this blind man came to Jesus because Jesus made him see. The apostle Paul came to Jesus because Jesus made him blind. Go back and read the story. And it's the exact opposite things that happened, but they both had the same result. Yeah, I, I thought of, when I was thinking about this this week, I thought, wouldn't it be cool if we could just go around this morning and just share our own unique experience of how we encountered Jesus? And I even thought about doing a floating microphone and say, tell me your story of Jesus, but some of you are really long-winded, and I, I couldn't do that. But everybody's got a unique approach. And, and I, what I want to say is, I, I just want to affirm you and however you have encountered him. It doesn't have to be like everybody else. Um, you know, I, when I, I grew up in the church, but I was in ninth grade. And I still remember, I was at a youth camp. The day that it finally dawned on me, for all the years I'd been in church, I, I still really wasn't a Christ follower. I had never asked Christ to forgive my sins. I had never made a commitment in my life to really try to follow him and be like him. And I can still remember at the end of that service in camp where I walked across this gravel floor that they had and knelt on a board down at the front and had someone pray with me as I committed my life to Christ. And that was a life-changing moment for me. I've got some friends that their, their encounter with Jesus was so unique. I, I had a man in my church several years ago who's an engineer, a uh, really brilliant guy, and he talked about growing up as an agnostic, and he said, you know, I, I had no ever never seen any evidence that there was a God, and so I never believed in one, and married a woman of faith, interestingly enough, and um, he talked about, he said, what happened for him was his father-in-law got very sick, and um, he realized that the oncologists weren't really telling the family the whole story. And he, he knew that his father-in-law was worse than what the doctors were saying. So he got up real early one morning and got to the hospital before the doctors arrived. And when he saw the oncologist, he caught him and he said, I need you to sit down with me today, this morning. And I need you to tell me exactly what's going on. And the oncologist was honest. And they said, your, your, your father-in-law has almost no hope, almost no hope. And, 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 and Mike said, he said, I was just blown away. I knew I was right. He said, and I'll never forget, he said, I was in a waiting room at the hospital that night. And he goes, and I was thinking about what the oncologist told me. And he said, I was thinking about my role in the family and how I was going to be able to comfort them. And I said, I didn't know what to say. And he said, I'm walking back and forth. And he said, I walked over to a window. I'm looking out into the dark. And he said, God, if there is a God, can you please tell me something that I need to hear? And he said, I looked down, and there was a, a Gideon Bible laying there on a the stand. And he said, I just instinctively just reached down and grabbed it and opened it. And he said, when I opened it up, he said, there was a passage of Scripture on the left-hand side on, in the right column. And he said, it was, it was illuminated in yellow. It was, he said, it, it looked like a highlighter, but it was, like, it was almost like it was glowing. And he said, and it was this verse from Jeremiah that, that talked about, I am the God who, who will walk with you through your most desperate times, and I will be your healer. And, and Mike just kind of, you know, just kind of freaked out. And he said, man, I, I, you know, I, I didn't know God could be this specific and giving me a word. And he goes, I, I got so scared. He said, I closed it and I threw it down. He goes, I knew nothing about the Bible. He said, I knew nothing about where that verse was. And all of a sudden, I thought, how am I going to show that to my family? You know, and he said, I grabbed it back up again. And he said, I opened it up to that very same page. And he goes, and that verse was still there, highlighted in yellow. And he goes, I'm reading it again. And he goes, I, I got to try to remember this. And he goes, and then I closed the Bible and I put it down. And he goes, later, it said the family didn't get there until a lot later. And he said, when they did, he goes, I couldn't remember where that verse was. And he, he said, I asked a chaplain and he didn't know. And he, he goes, I opened that same Bible again. And he goes, I'm reading, I'm going through it, through it, through it. He goes, I finally found the page. He goes, I went down the column and I found the verse. He said, but it wasn't highlighted anymore. He goes, and I knew that it didn't really look like a highlighter. It looked like it was glowing. And he goes, I'm an engineer. He goes, I don't have a, a, an instinctive supernatural bone in my body. He said, but I knew in that moment that the hand of God had come and met me right where, he said, right where I was. He goes, there was no denying that. And Mike said, that was the beginning of me saying, there is a God. And I discovered his name is Jesus. 
I remember a friend of mine named Earl. Earl had been a lifetime alcoholic and drug addict. Earl started drinking when he was eight years old. By the time he was 12, he was smoking marijuana and doing other drugs. He said by the time he was 18, he was, he was taking anything he could get his hands on. Earl was a, a, a drug addict for, for the next 20 years. He did 11 years in a federal penitentiary because he, he would steal to, to, to support his habit. And Earl said, I'll never forget one, one day. He goes, I'm, I'm 38 years old. And he said, I'm walking through my house. And he said, I heard this voice. And this voice said to me, if you don't stop, I'm going to have to let you go. And Earl said, I stopped and I turned around. And there was nobody there. He goes, and I, I realized that's God speaking to me. And, he, and he, said, he said, I didn't want to believe it. He said, I kind of shook it off. And he goes, no, it can't be God. It's got to be the drugs or something, you know. And he said, I, I, I kept on walking through the house. And he said, I heard the voice again. I said, if you don't stop, I'm going to have to let you go. He says, and it scared me so bad. He said, something shook inside of my soul. And he said, I got to go to church. And he goes, I realized it was Christmas Eve. And he goes, and so I, I went to the Christmas Eve service, that it was, which is at our church in Phoenix at the time. And he said, I went to that Christmas Eve service, and it was there at that Christmas Eve service that I cried out to, for, please, God, forgive me, a sinner. And he goes, and from that day on, my life was changed. And Earl got involved in our Celebrate Recovery program in Phoenix, and he was responsible for being one of our leaders and helping other men find their way back to God. What's your God story? It doesn't have to be like them. It doesn't have to be glowing pages. It doesn't have to be voices from heaven. For some of us, uh, our, our God story is as simple as the fact that when we were a kid, somewhere in a Sunday school class, somewhere in a Bible school, a teacher told us about this God who loved us, and it touched our hearts. It resonated true. And maybe even as young as five or six years old, we, we heard that story, and we said, I believe that. And we, and we made that commitment, even as kids, when we really didn't know all that we, all that we would know. And that from that day on, we became followers of Jesus Christ. I don't, I don't know what your God story is, but here's what I know. We have a God who's able to meet all of us uniquely right where we are. Does this make sense to you? The passage of Scripture in Acts chapter 15. The disciples were trying to figure out what to do with all of these uh, people who were coming to Jesus, who were Gentiles. And they, they, they came with all these different backgrounds, and they came with all this different stuff. And here, here, here's what it says. Uh, Peter said, you know, they finally came to this point where Peter said, you know what, we believe, that no matter their background, we believed that all are saved the same way by the undeserved grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I love how James said, you know, as they're taking this all in. Now, you got to remember, the, up till now, it had all been Jews coming to Jesus. They all had the same background. Now, all of a sudden, these guys who, who looked at life very differently coming. And here's what, here's, what, here's what James said. Read it with me. And so my judgment is that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. That's why I put this statement there. It doesn't matter how you come to Jesus, but only that you come to Jesus. Does that make sense to you? Let, let me give you another one. Another thought I had as I read this is, you know what? You, you don't know ha have to know everything about Jesus to know what he's done for you. You don't have to know everything about Jesus to know what he's done for you. I have an iPhone. How many of you have iPhones? Yeah. How many of you have Androids? They're still in the archaic ages. There you go. <laughs> Smartphones are unbelievable, aren't they? Um, you know, I, I could take this phone with me today to a restaurant, and it's got an app where I can, on it, that I can just scan a barcode, and that QR code will give me the entire menu for that restaurant right there. I don't even have to have a menu in my hand. I've got a Maps app, app in my phone. And no matter where I am, I can hit that Maps app, and it will give me directions on how to get that address. And it, about 80% of the time, it's, it's accurate, and, and it gets me there. 
Um, I, I've got an app on my phone that, uh, that I, I can listen to a song, and if I, I want to know more about that song, if I want to know the lyrics or who it's by, I can hit this app, and it listens to the song for me, and then it tells me who it is. And, and gives me the lyrics so that I can, I, I can read along. I've got, a, I've got a FaceTime app on this. How many of you have ever used FaceTime? Isn't that just a marvel? I mean, think, think, think this thought with me. When my grandkids were in Maryland, I could pull up FaceTime, I could call them, and somehow, magically, my phone would take my video, it would take my image and my voice, and it would transfer it into electronic signals and it would send it to a cell tower, and it would send it to somewhere else and somewhere else, and who knows where all that it goes up in space, and then it would come down on my grandkids' cell phone right where they were in Baltimore, Maryland, and I could see their image, and I could hear their voice, and we are talking back and forth in real time, somehow magically holding this little box. Look at me. I have no idea how this thing works. I have no idea. I don't know how it does that. Uh, you know, I've had six years of education. I don't understand it at all. And whenever my phone goes on the blink, I have to give it to my grandkids to figure it out, figure it out for me, you know what I'm saying? You know, I, I have no idea, but here's what I know. It works. It works. Now, look at me. You've got to get this. This is why this is so important to you. You don't know everything there is to know about Jesus. Here's the great news. You don't have to. Why is that important? Remember what happened to this guy in the story? These people who didn't believe in Jesus were trying to tell him why what he was telling them wouldn't work. They were trying to argue with him. They were trying to argue with theology. And, and sometimes that will happen to you. There will be people whom you will share what Christ has done for you. you know, they'll try to tell you, you know what, the, the Bible is irrelevant. You know half the Bible really isn't true. That stuff never really happened. You know that Jesus really wasn't a historical figure. They're going to tell you all of that. People can argue their, their theology. They can argue with the, about the canonization of the Bible. They can argue whether or not this is real or that is real. But here's one thing no one can legitimately argue with you they can't argue what God has done for you they can't you can't tell me what my experience is I can tell you who I was I can tell you what I was like and I can tell you why I'm different because Jesus Christ is my personal Lord and Savior and you can argue any of this stuff you want but you can't argue that with me does that make sense to you and, and that again that is that is just so important. Um, I, I love the story of the, the woman in, in, in John chapter 4, the woman at the well, where after she had this theological discussion to Jesus, she finally, Jesus revealed who he was, and she goes running into town, and, and she says, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this possibly be the Messiah? She didn't know anything about Jesus. Neither did the guy who was born blind. When these Pharisees are grilling him, they're going, is he a prophet? I don't know. Is he this? I don't know. Is he that? I don't know. Here's what I know. I was blind. Now I see. And you can't argue with that. Amen. Yeah, it's so funny. Um, I, even as a pastor, I, I get people all the time that want to, you know, want to ask philosophical questions or theological questions. And you know what? I'm just a gym rat who came to Jesus. You know, I've had six years of school. I've gotten just enough to get me a job. But I do know what God has done for me. And I always love when people want to want to talk to me about end times stuff. And uh, I, I'll never forget sitting down at a at a breakfast, a <laughs> metro breakfast one time. And we were all talking at the table. We had an empty seat. And this guy sat down and we're chatting for a second. And the table got quiet. And the guy looks around. He goes, anybody want to know what 666 really means? And it's like, oh, the one guy in this history that has actually figured out all of these, all of these secrets, you know, and he, he went on, and, and I thought, you know, it's such a boondog. In 1988, there was a guy, there was a guy who wrote a book called, called 88 Reasons Jesus is Coming Back in 88. Well, he didn't. And so what he did, no kidding, the very next year, he wrote a book called 89 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming Back in 89. And in that book, he describes why he missed it by a year. It, it, it doesn't matter. That, Jesus said, no man knows the times. No man knows. Only, only the Father. In fact, I love this. I saw that. I think it was Janet's mother that I saw posted this on Facebook. Throw this card. Let it pick up. Opie and, Opie and Andy talking. Paul, when is Jesus coming back? 
And he says, I don't rightly know, Opie. You see, we're, on, we're not on the planning committee. We're on the welcoming committee. <laughs> and all God's people said, Jesus never called you to be a Bible scholar. He just called you to be a witness. And all you really need to know is what he's done for you. That's the most important thing. Can I give you one more? Once you've encountered Jesus, embrace him. Once you've encountered Jesus, embrace him. In the story in John 9, after the Pharisees got through grilling the blind man and they they tossed him out of the synagogue, Jesus hears about what's going on. And here's what happens. This, This is on your outline. It says, when Jesus heard what had happened, he found the man and he asked him, do you believe in the Son of Man? The man answered, who is he, sir? I want to believe in him. You have seen him, Jesus said, and he is speaking to you. Yes, Lord, I believe, the man said, and he worshiped Jesus. You see, this man went from an encounter with Jesus to following Jesus. And that's what Jesus really wanted. Now, this hit me when I, when I was reading the passage and, I, and I, I hit that part of the text. It hit me because, you know, we're, we're a culture who are really big on experiences. And yet, what happens after the experience? I, I mean, I, I think about it for a second. Go on, stay with me. Do you, you realize how much effort and planning and money goes into planning a wedding? Anybody want to guess what the average cost of a wedding in the U.S. is right now? $30,000. $30,000. How, how many of you are like me? You got married years ago and you paid less than 1000 Less than 100 Yeah. Wanda's dad gave us $800 and said, I hope you elope. You know, he just kind of, yeah. And and $30,000, and here's what, and and I've done a lot of weddings, but here's the deal. One of the things that hits me time and time again is we spend way more effort thinking about the wedding than we do the marriage. We spend a lot more time and energy and money thinking about this event rather than this life that we're going to spend together. And would you agree with me? It's the life that really matters. The life. In fact, throw that up on the screen for me. Anybody recognize that wedding? Come on, how many of you know who that is? Come on. Who is it? Yeah, Kim Kardashian. Who's the guy she's marrying? You got one of three choices. Go ahead. (laughs) Yeah, that's Chris Humphrey, a professional basketball player. Yeah. Uh, they got married, I think it was 2011 when they got married. Anybody, anybody want to guess how much they spent on their wedding? How much? A million? Who said a million? $11 million. $11 million. They were married for 72 days. Do the math. All, all I want to say is this. God wants you to encounter him. He wants you to open your heart and let him touch you in a very personal and profound way. Look at me. But he's looking for more than that. Jesus doesn't want just a date. He wants to marry you. He wants to be a part of your life forever. Amen? Look at the passage of scripture from Colossians 2, verse 6. Read it with me. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in Him. Continue to live your lives in Him. That's why I put this statement on your outline. You know what? Jesus doesn't want just a fabulous first encounter. He's looking for a friend for life. So what's your God story? What has Jesus done for you? That's the most important question you could answer. 
I want you to do something for me. If uh, you brought, if you got your communion cup, I want you to go ahead and take a moment. I want you to, I want you to peel back the plastic top and take out that styrofoam wafer. And I want you to just take a moment. And I want you in your own heart. Can you answer that question? What has Jesus done for you? And maybe, maybe you're like the blind man. At, and you've, you've been around religion for a long time. But you've never really let Jesus touch you in a personal, profound way. Today, I double dog dare you to open your heart and say, Lord, meet me here. Would you touch me like you touched him? Maybe you're tired of just living your life out of your own strength. Maybe you're just, you know, kind of have done this all on your own and you're getting tired. You know, you don't have to do that. Maybe you've messed up badly multiple times. And you're going, you know, Steve, you really think God wants somebody like me? Yes, he does. Yes, he does. Jesus said, I, I haven't come to call the healthy man. I've come, I've come, to, I, I've come to find sinners. But that's why Paul said, I'm the worst of them all. And no matter who you are, what you've done, or where you've been, if you will open your heart to Christ this morning, he will not only forgive you of your past, listen to this, he'll stay with you to the future. And he'll never leave you or forsake you. Maybe for some of us, we've had that encounter, but maybe like sometimes that happens in our, our marriages, maybe sometimes we just have gotten a little bit kind of dull and gotten a little bit bland, maybe... Maybe you just want to say, Lord, I, I need a fresh touch today. I, I want to love you like I first loved you. I, I want to be connected to you like I did at the very beginning. Maybe, maybe that's, that's your prayer today. Or, or maybe some of you, man, your, your walk is tight and your walk with God is passionate. And maybe today as you hold these elements in your hand, you just want to say, thank you, God. Thank you for loving somebody like me. Don't know what your prayer is, but this is what I know. God's got his ear turned toward each one of us. So during, while we sing this song, this is a beautiful chorus from an old hymn that I grew up with. It says, he touched me. And this morning, I just want you to open your heart for a first touch, a fresh touch, an encouraging touch, whatever it is you need from God, you open your heart while Chuck leads us in this chorus and then when we're done, I'm, I'm going to lead us in a prayer before we take the elements together. Open your heart to the Lord. Chuck. He touched me.
Lord Jesus, as we come before you today, um, these elements that we hold on our hand, this little wafer and this little cup of juice, represent your body and your blood that was spilt for us. You didn't come from heaven to earth so that we could have one more religion. You came from heaven to earth so that we might have a personal relationship with God. We can do all kinds of religious activities. We can memorize the Bible. We can do lots of good deeds. But if we don't have you, Lord Jesus, it's, it's just warm noodles and chicken soup. It's the chicken tetrazzini without the chicken. And we're missing the main thing. So, Lord, we open our hearts to you. You know exactly where we're at. For those of us maybe who have never prayed a prayer of faith before, to those of us who have walked with you for 50 or more years. But we come and ask you this morning, Lord, for a fresh touch from your hand. Would you meet us today at our point of need? You know those of us that need healing. You know those of us, Lord, that need our, uh, our relationship with you reignited. You know those of us, Father, who have been a long way off. But today, we're responding to your grace. Lord, would you touch us in a personal way, in a profound way. Even though we may never know much theology, would you become so real to us this morning that what we can say without hesitation is I once was blind, but now I see. That's our story. And you made it all possible. We love you, Lord. And it's in the precious name of that Lord Jesus Christ that we pray today. And everyone said,